Uh, hi everyone, I'm Merdal from University of Washington. Uh, uh, Ali and I are here, are here to talk about our work, NetScatter, enabling large scale backscatter networks. Backscatter communication is interesting because it enables very low power uh, wireless communication. We have seen work, uh, interesting work starting from ambient backscattered, which could work up to one meter. Uh, then we saw passive Wi Fi, which could do uh, Wi Fi backscattered at limited ranges. And recently, people have shown that LoRa backscatter can enable long range backscatter communication uh, up to kilometer range. So, using LoRa backscatter, uh, we can have sensors that could work up to uh, 10 years on a single button cell battery, and they cost only a few cents on IC. Further, we can get long ranges up to kilometer uh, at line of sight. So while this long range is great, it also opens, opens up a significant networking challenge. As an example, in the floor of an office building, uh, there can be hundreds of these devices which operate at long ranges, and all of them need to be supported with a single access point. In this talk, I'm going to present NetScatter. We present the first wireless network protocol that supports hundreds of concurrent transmissions from backscatter devices. To achieve this capability, we design a distributed coding mechanism that works below noise floor, and we can decode all transmission using a single FFT operation. And finally, we deploy a network of 256 devices using only 500 kilohertz bandwidth. Our results show that we can improve network physical rate, link layer throughput, and finally, we can reduce network latency. Here's the outline of this talk. First, we will describe our distributed chip spectrum coding that allows us to uh, achieve hundreds of concurrent transmissions from backscatter devices. Then we'll focus on uh, practical issues such as timing synchronization and near-far problem. And finally, we'll explain our network deployment of 256 devices. So let's first focus on uh, distributed chip spread spectrum coding. Before going to that, uh, I'm going to first explain what is chip spread spectrum. Chip is a signal with linearly increasing frequency over time. Chip spread spectrum encodes bits in cyclic shifts. As an example, this plot shows a chip with zero cyclic shift, which represents bit zero. The second plot shows another chip which is cyclically shifted by half a time period and represents bit one. The way that you decode chip is by correlating and getting an FFT. This is what we get in FFT domain. Different cyclic shift results in a peak in different FFT bin which, is, which we can then map to the corresponding bit. The nice thing about this modulation is that people have shown it works down to minus 149 dBm. This means you can decode signals when they are really weak, and we can enable long-range communication. <laughs> the drawback, however, is that we're losing data rate to achieve long-range communication. For example, to get a range of hundreds of meters, your data rate could be as low as one kilobit per second. This is a problem because let's say we have a network of devices where each device supports up to one kilobit per second. If we use time division multiplexing to uh, support hundreds of these devices, your data rate could be as low as 10 bit per second. This could be even worse if we have 1,000 devices in the network. Therefore, this shows that TDMA does not scale really well with the number of devices at these long ranges. Our key observation in chirp spread spectrum is that in the frequency domain, there is only one FFT peak at each time. This means that the rest of the frequencies are unutilized at each point in time. Our idea is to use all these frequency bins by having multiple backscatter devices transmit at the same time in a way that they all fall into different FFT bins. To do this, we introduce chirp, distributed chirp spread spectrum. Uh, where we assign different cyclic shift to different backscatter devices. 
In particular, each device is assigned to use a specific cyclic shift and sends data by either transmitting cyclic shift or not transmitting it. As an example, here both Alice and Bob are transmitting bit one by sending their assigned cyclic shift. In the frequency domain, we get two FFT peaks which correspond to Alice and Bob's data. Next, Alice is sending bit one and Bob is sending bit zero. In this case, we get only one FFT peak which corresponds to Alice's data, and so on. So we can have multiple backscatter devices backscatter at the same time. Further, since more backscatter devices are putting more power into the network, we can, we can increase the network throughput. So I gave you an example of two devices. Let's see how our network works with more devices. Assume we have a network of 100 of these devices. First, the access point sends query message and assigns cyclic shift to each device. Then all backscatter nodes transmit their data to the access point at the same time using their assigned cyclic shift. Afterward, the access point does correlation and performs FFT operation to demodulate all transmissions. It then looks at the energy of each FFT bin, which shows whether the corresponding device sends bit zero or bit one. I gave you an example of hundreds of devices. However, how many concurrent transmission can we actually support in our network? Let's look at a typical LoRa configuration. A typical LoRa configuration uses 500 kilohertz bandwidth and has 512 cyclic shift. This means we can theoretically support up to 512 concurrent transmission using only 500 kilohertz bandwidth. So this is how it is in theory, but let's see what are the practical issues that we need to solve to enable this. I'm going to hand over to Ali. He's going to talk about practical issues. Now let's understand what are the issues in implementing distributed chirp spread spectrum in practice. The first practical issue is timing synchronization. Let's say there are two devices in the network, Alice and Bob, and they are assigned adjacent cyclic shifts. In an ideal world, both of them are perfectly synchronized and we would see two peaks in adjacent FFT bins. However, that's not the case in practice and they have a slightly different timings. Let's say uh, Alice has offset of exactly one cyclic shift. In this case, both of their frequency profile are going to merge in the time domain and they would occupy the same FFT bin. This means that mis timing mismatch causes interference between Alice and Bob. The dominant factor for timing mismatch is hardware delay variations. We ran experiments across devices in our network over time and measured the delay variation. Here, I'm showing one minus CDF of uh, the delay. As you can see, less than 3% of the nodes over time have a delay variation of more than two microseconds. And two microseconds in the time domain translates to one sample and hence one FFT bin when using 500 kilos bandwidth. Now that we know that the delay variation is one cyclic shift, we solve timing synchronization by skipping every other cyclic shift. In this scenario, instead of having a transmission in all the FFT bins, we have transmissions in every other FFT bin. This, of course, means that we are going to reduce the number of concurrent transmissions from, uh, from the theoretical value of 512 to 56 number of devices. The next practical issue is a near far problem. Say there are two devices in the network, Alice and Bob, such that Alice is much further away from the access point. When Alice transmits data, since it's close to the access point, since it's far from the access point, we would see an, a, small FFT, uh, a small peak in the FFT domain. Now, when Bob transmits data, since it's very close to the access point, he would receive a very high amplitude FFT peak, which can overwhelm Alice's peak, and in that case, we cannot decode its data. Our solution 
uh, to this problem is to assign cyclic ships to different devices more strategically and based on their power. What we are going to do is we assign all the high power devices or cl closed devices to close F50 bins and all the low power ones to the far away bins. In other words, we are clustering similar power devices together. We, however, still need to deal with the fact that the wireless channel change and in turn the power of each package scatter node change over time. Our solution is to have a power adaptation algorithm in which uh, each device uses access point query message signal strengths to, ad to adjust its power. So how do we do power adaptation in a backscatter device? Typical backscatter devices use just uh, one impedance to do reflections, which translates to only one power level. In our design, we use multiple impedances, and we switch between them to achieve different power levels. Our implementation uses three, imp three impedances to give us three power levels of 0 dB, minus 4 dB, and minus 10 dB. The key here is that we reduce the power of package scatter device from 0 dB to get different power levels. The way we use this in the system is that we, we start with minus 4 dB, and if we want to increase the power, we would go to 0 dB, and if we want to decrease it, we would go to minus 10 dB. Now, let's talk about our deployment. At first, let's see how we implemented this. We have implemented our backscatter device using discrete components, including FPGAs and microcontrollers, and we created a large number of these devices, as you can see in the picture. We implemented the access point using uh, USRP with co-located transmit and receive antennas. Here is our deployment. It has 256 number of devices, and it spans multiple rooms. The red dot shows the access point, and the blue dots are the devices. We compared our network with both LoRa backscatter with and without red adaptation using a query response with a scheduling. Note that LoRa backscatter does not support red adaptation. To compare with an ideal case, we pick the maximum data rate supported by each backscatter node based on its RSSI to, impl to implement rate adaptation. Now let's look at net, uh, network file layer results. In this plot, we show five data rate in kilobit per second on y-axis and the number of backscatter devices on the x-axis. Here is LoRa backscatter with nine kilobit per second five data rate. And here is LoRa backscatter with rate adaptation which ends up picking higher data rates. Finally, this is net scatter. As we can see, the physical layer data rate increases all, uh, almost linearly with the number of devices. As we increase the number of devices, the distance between the occupied FFT, bin, uh, FFT bins or cyclic shifts decreases, which makes interference more likely to happen. Net scatter improves the file data rate by a factor of 7 to 26 compared to the two other schemes. Now, let's look at the link layer results. This graph shows that the link layer gains are higher than the physical layer gains. And the reason for that is, in the link layer, we have to deal with all kinds of network overheads, in, including preambles, CRCs, and headers for, for each individual packet. Since in our case, all the devices are transmitting at the same time, we have to deal with this overhead only once. This results in this results in uh, higher gains compared to link layer, compared to file layer, despite having to coordinate for cyclic shifts and power levels. Finally, let's look at the latency comparisons. Netscatter improves latency by a factor of 15 to, 20, 15 to 67. For sensor networks, this is a key advantage of using concurrent transmissions. Since the sensor can Gets, get its the data faster to the access point. To summarize, we presented NetScatter, which is the first network protocol to, that enables 
concurrent transmissions of uh, hundreds of packet scatter devices. With that, I'm going to conclude the talk and happy to answer questions. Uh, questions, please walk up to any of the microphones. So uh, let me start with uh, the first question. So um, at some level, how is this different from, say, frequency division? Because if I take you know, these chirps, multiply them by a down chirp, they're basically like single tones at different frequencies. And you're asking different backscatter devices to transmit on different frequencies at that level. So can you, can you explain a little bit about how this contrasts to like, you know, traditionally how we've been doing things like frequency modulation? Mm -hmm. So the, the difference here is that uh, b in, a, in a chirp spread spectrum, each of them are cyclically shifted. If the, if the sampling rate, rate is higher, we would see exactly yes. You are, we would see the increasing in frequency, each chirp will be shifted. But in, in our case, because, it's, uh, because the sampling rate is equal to the bandwidth, so each, each chirp, when, it, uh, when, it, uh, when we shift it, it will uh, result in different cyclic shifts. So this is, this is in, uh, when you have the same bandwidth as, uh, uh, when you have the same bandwidth as sampling rate, this is, uh, this is what you would get. We have a question. Have a question. Is, this, is this protocol designed for static settings, or it, does it work when the backscatter nodes are moving around? Uh, can, we can you be closer to the mic? Is this protocol designed for a static setting, or do these things, do this protocol, does this protocol work when the backscatter nodes are moving around? Yeah, I'll go with it. So, so basically, when we uh, deployed our network, uh, in that environment, there were people who were moving, uh, and there was like fading and mobility effect in our system. But specifically, our deployment, we didn't move the devices to have like that much variation. I, I suppose you have to reassign the, the shift, the, the phase shifts, and all, uh, all these so other allocations. Oh, I see. To add on that, uh, we, we have different power levels. At first, when, if uh, fading and mobility is, uh, causing, uh, is causing that the device cannot uh, sense its data to the access point, it will change its power level. It, be, it goes to 0 dB or it decreases if it's uh, too high. If, this, if the power adjustment does not work for multiple transmissions, then the device uh, would, uh, would go to, would, re uh, would, would restart the association, association process again. So this is how, uh, dynamically, this is how it works. And the details of uh, association phase is in the paper, but didn't go in the presentation. Yeah. Thank you. So while the next speaker sets up, I'll ask one more question. Uh, what about uh, li like resilience to noise? Can you talk about that? Uh, at some level, there's a separation between like chirps to get, provide some noise resilience. You're reducing that. So how does, how does that dynamic change? So for, uh, for the noise we have, shown, uh, we have shown in our paper, if you have, if you have two devices, uh, that, one of them is, uh, is that one of them is 40 or 50 dB higher than, the, for, higher than the other one, with the cyclic shift as assignment that we have, then you can, you can see even if it's 40 dB higher than the other one, the noise, uh, the sensitivity doesn't change. So the cyclic shift assignment is uh, the way that we are doing and clustering the, all the high power devices and low power devices together, that helps with the noise and effect of the devices on each other. Okay. Yeah. Let's uh, thank the speakers again. Thank you.